Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Short Explanations Podcast. My name is Hiam. Tom is there, like right there, Hello. right there. This is episode five, and we're going to call this multi-factor authentication because we talked about passwords, and now we have to do the next step. We have to do our second factor. We're going to soon be into our third factor, but for right now, we are spending our time on the second factor. And before I introduce Tom, once again, you are listening to the Short Explanations Podcast. If you're coming from any other site, please stop right now, pause everything, go go switch the RSS to you, go to shortexplanations.com, resubscribe. It really helps us. You still may be getting it from the other site for a few more weeks, but for right now, stop, change it, be done with it. Welcome to the new hotness. And I was telling Tom pre-show, I love what we've done. And and a lot of it was thanks to him. I am now an RSS guru and hopefully everything is good and you like it. I am unreasonably happy uh, with the tech that we've put together. Unreasonably so. Like I was telling him, I just love how easy everything is. I mean, it's not as easy as clicking some buttons in WordPress, but it's not much harder. And like you said, we are not beholden to literally anybody. We can do yeah. this. We can do this in our bunker during nuclear war. We like we can do this, and no one will stop us. I'm, uh, I'm adjusting my light, so I apologize uh-huh. for the weirdness in the video. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, we are talking <laughs> about. Oh, go. Oh, I was gonna say we were talking about two-factor authentication. So so we covered the last pass breach. Okay. We still obviously recommend the password manager. We talked about passwords last week, which I think was a really good episode. And and we didn't get into the nitty gritty of like how entropy and how long a password should be. Remember, we just said, let the password manager uh, handle it. Now you have to get into the thing that I hate more than anything, but you have to do is that second factor. You have to have that backup that's not just a password. So in case your password manager does get leaked or whatever it is, they still need to contact you with something that you have. And I may be jumping the gun, but it's it's something you have that becomes a lot more important and a lot more makes you a lot safer overall. So what are factors? What are we talking about when we talk about factors? Uh, and factors are different ways of authenticating yourself or proving that you are who you say you are. Um, imagine a computer system where you just type a username in and you hit go and the system goes, yeah, all right. You're trustworthy enough. I like your face. Yeah, you're definitely that person you said you are. And it just lets you in. Well, that would be crazy. Uh, but believe it or not, that's actually how these things used to work in the past. Uh, it, passwords have not been around forever. They had to be invented, believe it or not. Like old mainframe systems used to just type in your username when it was a multi-user system. Um, so the factors and the various types of factors all depend on a whole bunch of things. But generally, it boils down to something you know, uh, which is going to be a password. Right? It's something you know that's not really shared with anyone or shouldn't be shared with anyone or should be shared with everyone, I should say. Um, there are things you are, which would be things like biometric identifiers, right? Like in the super secret spy movie, the person puts their eye up to the retinal scanner and logs in. Or more boring, you put your thumb on the, the fingerprint sensor on your phone and it lets you in. That's something you are. Uh, and then there's also something you have have, uh, which generally is a security key of some kind or a dongle with, you know, a rotating six digit code or you fire up Google Authenticator on your phone. And it's got a list of all those six digit codes. Uh, it's basically it's something that you have possession of, but you don't necessarily know it offhand, right? It's not like you're memorizing all of those six digit codes because they change every minute. Uh, so it kind of... Uh, basically ensures that if somebody steals your password, they have to have one of those other factors, either something you are or something you have to gain access to your account. And it makes everything way safer, like unreasonably safer. One of the things that people in the, in InfoSec complain about is, and we're going to get to this, that SMS is so terrible and so broken. But 
and I, don't cite me on this, they did an analysis of this, and they found out that you are 99% safer with, with a two-factor anything, including SMS. So the people that are arguing are complaining about that 1%, which is the problem. And we shouldn't be arguing about that. We should be focused on getting everyone to have that second factor in whatever it is. And Tom didn't mention that fourth factor, which is the new the new hotness, the up and coming one, which is the location. Uh, I, I don't pers personally buy into it, but maybe... I mean, I can see it as a weak second factor, but you have to be in the location you say you are. And and that's that's important because if somebody can get you from somewhere else, at least to say, hey, you don't you're not in the middle, you're not in Nigeria somewhere logging in, or you're not in some call center in Los Angeles. You're you're right here on the East Coast, and so something's up, and then we're gonna throw a captcha for you that you can't answer anyway. So it doesn't matter. Exactly. The the location as a another factor is typically used as a tertiary factor, but in the background, you're not really going to see it. But if you've ever logged into a Google account from a hotel, like while you're on vacation or something or an Apple account, it will pop up that scary thing saying, whoa, 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 you usually don't log in from here. We we're not sure it's you. And what happens then is a lot of the times these major websites will have kind of gradations of your login, right? So if you're on your home computer that you've logged into a million and a half times, you know, is it going to ask for a second factor all the time if you've hit that remember me box? No, probably not. But you then take that computer and you go on vacation with it and you try to log in and all of a sudden it's coming from a different area of the country or a different part of the world. It looks really weird because, okay, it's the same computer, but it's at a totally different place. Let's go ahead and pop up that 2FA code box just to make sure everything is up on the up and up. Um, so a lot of the times location will be kind of a, a hidden third factor. Now, is it something to absolutely 100% rely on all the time to keep you safe? No. But like everything with security, it's security in depth. It's a bunch of different factors to try to get into uh, and a, a bunch of different checks that you have to pass to gain access to your account. Effectively, better safe than sorry. I think I, I think the overall the overarching theme is passwords are just not safe anymore. And the point is anything that adds to it, whether you see it or you don't see it, is going to be the answer. And unfortunately, the problem with all of this is that it makes your life I don't want to say it like significantly harder. Significantly is not the right word. But it's it's the oh, I just forgot that upstairs. I forgot all these things upstairs. And the more you complain about it, the stronger that security protection is. And 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 you know what? The good news is, is that we're the FIDO Alliance and we're going to get to it is trying to help us stop that problem. So I guess we should go through. What, what Tom put here for us, by the way, he did the show notes and they are excellent. So I will, I will continue with it. So the first thing you log in, sometimes they say, click your email, check your email. That's great. I mean, it's not great, great, but you know what? It's saying you probably have possession of your email somehow. They want you to click this link or give a code or whatever it is. The problem is as you go places, if you just check, remember me everywhere else, people have your email. Uh, it's not like amazingly great but again we're talking about that one percent if you're in that one percent who has a problem you're probably you're probably listening to this podcast not as as entertainment and not actual knowledge but it's trying to get your family members it's trying to get your coworkers safe and to say let's do anything other than just put our passwords in some sort of have your inconvenient let it be email and eventually sms a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of products will actually um, like mandates the wrong word, but they will enroll you in email based two factor authentication by default. Most of the time when you're creating an account on a website, it's not just username and password anymore. It's usually an email address as a username and a password. Uh, and what that means is, hey, they've got an email address. You had to click on a link to activate your account in the first place. They know your email address is good, at least at that point in time. Uh, so a lot of times uh, a company or a service will just automatically turn on email-based two-factor authentication because they know they can send stuff to you. They've already proven that. 
uh, might as well just add the belt and suspenders of a different second factor. And most of the time on these websites, if they've gone that far and if they're that forward thinking, um, they'll have other forms of two-factor authentication, which we will get into in a bit, uh, that you can upgrade to, to get rid of the email part. Uh, but by default, if you don't do anything, if you take the absolute laziest route, yeah, you'll have to check your email and put in the code. What, what I've now started to see is they ask for your username. They don't even ask for your password. They just ask for your username. They send it to you. And in that email, they say, here's your password reset form like verify it and then you create your password there. I just wish they were a little more forthcoming with it because sometimes it's, they don't do the type your password in twice anymore. It's just once, if you forget it, they'll just do the password reset. I just wish they were a little forthcoming. Sign up with your email, you'll get, you have to verify and then you'll do your password. Like just, just be upfront with it. Just help me out there. Um, I have an issue, the next one is SMS. I have issues with this because I use Google Voice for a lot of stuff. But SMS, that's the please put your phone number in and we'll message you. I think the the biggest problem with that is not that it's insecure, and we'll get to that in a second, but that's a little more private. It's like, what are you doing with my phone number? I, Gawker, you, no, Gawker, you, I, I don't want my phone number with you uh, because how do I know it's safe? And we've seen stories. Facebook has used that as a, used that two factor code, not the two factor code, the phone, the phone number to sell ads against that location with the three digit uh, area code or some sort of other thing. But it's just weird. Like I understand what they're doing. It's great for your grandparents. It's great for people. Your your tech, your less techie friends, because they all know what an SMS is. They all know how to type that in. But, and if that's the bare minimum, then that's fine. I don't want to argue why that 1% is not there. But my biggest problem is I use Google Voice and it will try to SMS and it will fail. And now I'm locked out because they didn't tell me that Google Voice doesn't work. And I have a problem with that. Yeah, I it's getting better. Um, but yeah, I've, I have also run into problems with Google Voice, especially companies that hand roll their own like SMS authentication stack. Most of the time you integrate with someone like Twilio or another third party company that's you know good at this stuff. Uh, and they tend to work fine most of the time. Uh, but, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at you, twitch.tv that we're streaming on right now. Uh, yeah, I got locked out of my Twitch account thanks to them not working with Google Voice. Uh, and that was super annoying to get fixed. Um, but yeah, like uh, sure the like major security geeks and, and people that that really understand hardcore technical details about the stuff and really have stuff worth guarding rally against SMS based authentication because uh, it turns out phone companies are kind of easy to hack and not necessarily in the technical way as in they're broken, but uh, they're first line support personnel, right? People have uh, on many, many, many documented occasions, uh, done a thing where they're like, oh no, I'm just getting a new phone and I'm totally this guy, Bob. Uh, transfer Bob's number to this, this SIM card. And now all of a sudden they're getting Bob's two factor codes and Bob gets owned. Um, and yeah, that's a possibility, but you have to be basically targeted by an attacker for them to pull this off. It's not gonna be a drive-by thing. It's not gonna hit everyone, at least I hope not. Um, so if your options are nothing or SMS-based two-factor authentication, use the SMS. It's fine in the vast majority of cases. Uh, now, if you are a CEO or a CFO or a president of a nation, yeah, pick something better than SMS-based two-factor. Uh, but if you're just a regular person out on the street, it's fine. It's good enough. And it's way, way better than just having a password. Don't go to your your Thanksgiving dinner, your Christmas dinner, your Easter dinner, your Passover dinner, your any other dinner, and advocate for at the bottom your Yubico OTP to people who don't know what two-factor is. If, if they want to de dig deeper than why, why you complain about SMS, that's fine. 
but you don't need to explain the Series 7 attack or anything else. If the answer is, I don't have SMS two-factor on, let's just get to that first. Like, that that's the bare minimum. Get there and then move on. Um, and if you want to go a little deeper down the rabbit hole, the other reason why I like Google Voice two-factor is because if you don't have your phone, you may be able to log in to Google Voice a different way in, in the worst case. So if someone were to do that, and you disable the phone or you erase it because you can do that from your computer, they can't get your code because they have to be authenticated into your Google account, which is a little different, which is another reason why I like it. But I'm looking at you, Zell, for, for, for deprecating Google Voice SMS in the middle of without telling me, which is a really, really big problem. So uh, let's... Let's talk about dongle-based two-factor authentication. Now, thankfully, thankfully, this is becoming more rare. Um, and I say thankfully because I was the RSA token administrator for a long number of years for a previous company I worked at, uh, and they are nothing but trouble. The software hasn't been updated since at the latest, the mid-90s, uh, and they were just awful, awful pieces of hardware to try to manage. Um, so you might have seen this, especially if you've been working in enterprises for a little bit, you will get a physical, like, thick keychain dongle that's got a, a six-digit or eight-digit uh, mini LCD screen readout on it that has a constantly rotating code. Um, those were super popular back in the day, back before the invention of TOTP or, you know, back before text messaging was super widespread for, you know, security and two-factor purposes. Uh, to do two-factor, you bought a little dongle from RSA or from VeriSign, and it would have this code on it, and it's a physical hardware device, and the battery would last for anywhere between three and five years. So you have to... <laughs> absolutely have to replace that thing before it dies. Um, and they're fine. They're as safe as something like TOTP or the Google Authenticator codes on your phone, but it's yet another thing you have to carry. Uh, on the upside, yeah, there's nothing really connected anywhere to get hacked. Um, somebody has to physically destroy the device to get the key material inside it. That's kind of cool. Uh, but most of the time, it was just super annoying. Um, is it better than a password? Oh, yeah, 100% better than just a password alone. But it does mean that with enough time, like I had four or five of these things on a keychain at one point in my life, and it just became super annoying to put those in my pocket. I mean, I could just think of you, um, like, you needed two of them. I can't see you going to your administrator being like, hey, uh, can I get another one? Like I, I constantly, can I leave one at home and one here? It was all, that was the problem. You needed one. And, and I remember eBay gave them out. As soon as eBay gave one out, I was like, I got to have this. And then, I don't know, 10 years later, after the battery started going, they're like, no, we're just going to do TOTP and move on. But you're right. I did have one. I thought I was awesome because I had one, but it's, it was great at the time. I'm glad that they moved away. I'm glad we're going to talk about TOTP in a second and and moving from there. So so the, the next iteration, oh, go ahead. The uh the other issue with those dongles is less for the users cuz usually usually uh there wasn't a cost associated with them, especially like at a workplace. They just we just handed them out to to employees. Um but for the administrators uh, there was definitely a cost. There was a licensing cost to each dongle. We had to pay for the hardware. We had to pay for the licensing. We had to pay for maintenance. To make our users safer, it required a decent amount of money that ate into our IT budget, uh, which is not great. If you are uh, like we were, if you were an IT department operating on a shoestring budget, well, you can't not have two-factor. But also, like, buying that many tokens means, you know, a few less laptop upgrades that year, uh, or however the math ended up working out. It's been a while. Uh, but, you know, in a world now where two-factor authentication and TOTP is like, oh, I'll just download these two open source packages and, oh, look, everything just works magically. That's incredible. That is that is a, 
a huge amount of uh, support systems and money that you just don't have to worry about anymore, which is great. It's we'll get to that when we get to Yubico, but they're not cheap. I mean, like you said, your employees get them, but when you're talking about fifty twenty five or fifty dollars a person, and I have no idea what it is now, but that's a lot of money, especially if you if you are on a shoestring budget, and it's just to authenticate. It's not to do anything else, and and so that became a problem. The next one is Google Authentic, uh, not Google Authenticator, TOTP, Time Something. Time protocol. Uh, I am the worst security person because I forget what TOTP stands for. It's uh, time protocol. Time-based time one-time password. Okay. Again, it's just, I, I mean, I, I don't want to make it too easy, but it's the same as the token. It, it's mm. Except it's a digital token. It, it uses some some hash function on a Q, it's the QR code. You take a picture with your phone of the QR code. It put, it has some sort of a secret key and it you put it into your phone on, on one of the many apps and every 30 seconds it rotates the code and you are good to go. And that's the next level. Are they more safer than RSA or are they just different? I don't think they're more safer other than the, the reading. Yeah, the, the risks have changed a little bit because whereas something like an RCA or a RSA token or VeriSign token um, does have key material, it's not connected to anything. Uh, whereas something running Google Authenticator uh, most of the time is running on a cell phone and most of the time that is connected to the internet. So is it easy to get into those and get the codes? Not really, unless something gets root access on your phone. So yeah, it's it's pretty well locked down. Um, but is it easier to get it than getting inside of everybody's RSA tokens at the same time? Yeah, infinitely easier than that. So, I mean... So the 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 big the the big one in the room was Google Authenticator. They were like some bare bones. I feel like an intern wrote it in an afternoon. Like it was a twenty percent summer project because it was so bare bones. You took a picture of it, and and you, in the past you've heard us talk about this. I mean, if you've been listening for a while, take a picture of it. Uh, sit before you do all this. Sit sit down. Think about what you're doing because you can get locked out. But with Google Authenticator, you take the picture of the QR code. And it puts it on your phone. The problem was Google didn't have a, a move throughout. Like you lost your phone. Then what? You were locked out. There was no transferring this. And because you don't necessarily want to transfer those codes to something else. That feels like a vector of attack. If, if a bad actor can copy it or has physical access to your phone, it was one of those things. No, you can't transfer it. So we gave the advice of of taking pr literally printing out the QR codes and putting them in a safe deposit box or putting them off site or wherever you back stuff up. I mean, what I did is I took a screenshot of it and encrypted it on a USB key or something like that. But that was the problem. Then other people came out, Authy came out and said, you know what, we're going to do it across. Uh, it's going to be in the cloud. Take it, take it with what you want. Uh, Microsoft Authenticator is also good. They're all good. There's there's no like one killer feature. Google Authenticator still does not allow you to to back it up anywhere, which is a problem. Like you lose your phone or you get a new phone, how do you do it? And I remember being okay because I did have it on a different device. Uh it allows you one login to get into your phone after a restart, which was a little weird, but I was able to get in no problem. But I can see that being a thing. Authy is in the cloud. It uses Twilio and it allows you to, to put them on different machines and you can have it on your computer and on your phone. It does reduce the security, I guess, because it's on multiple areas, but, but I, I think that's the trade-off that's probably worth it. Yeah, you've kind of like, I hate saying this because in general, like if, if I were suggesting any regular computer user, any regular mobile device user, I, I would say just use Authy. It's fine. Um, you have to balance the level of convenience you want with the level of risk you will accept. Because yeah, Authy does back things up to the cloud. Uh, they do make you put in 
a password, uh, a backup password, uh, effectively, to encrypt against. Um, but for some people, that might be an unacceptable risk. They might say, oh, no, I don't want my stuff touching anyone else's systems. It has to be my data and my data alone. And that's totally fine. If you're comfortable with managing your own keys, by all means, do it. But for regular average people out there, I think Authy is way better security than the risks would, you know, would force you to mitigate to another solution. I was going to say, Bitwarden, if you pay for their premium feature, they have it built in. You got to be a little careful. It's th now your password manager has your two-factor codes. Again, that's that risk involved. Like if you lost it with LastPass, now they have your two-factor codes, which is also not good. So again, a risk you have to think about. Uh, Microsoft Authenticator, I hear, is really good, especially if you're in the 365 app, uh, ecosystem. I don't know what Duo is, but Duo has their own. I, I think it's part dongle. I don't know. Yeah, so Duo, Duo's a little strange, and it's it's gotten better over the years. I used to harp on Duo because it was really easy to break Duo's two-factor authentication, and it was of no fault of, or little fault of Duo's. Uh, it was the fault of the humans pushing the button. Uh, but that also gets into victim blaming territory, which feels a little sketchy to me. So the issue and how Duo works is that uh, you would install the Duo Auth uh, Authenticator app on your phone. And then when you go to log into a site uh, that uses Duo Authenticator, um, you type in your username, your password, you hit enter, cool, all that checks out. Your phone would now pop up a push notification saying, hey, um, are you trying to log in? Go ahead and click yes or click no. Uh, and if you click no, it locked the account and you know booted the bad guys out. Um, if you clicked yes, it just let them in. The issue is that computer users, especially people who don't have an innate understanding of how these systems work, are afraid of clicking the wrong thing. They're afraid of breaking something. So when something pops up and says, oh, hey, we need access to continue running. Are you trying to log in? They're just going to be like, oh, yeah, sure, that's fine. Please don't break anything. Uh, and they might not understand what they're allowing to happen. Uh, another thing that can happen and has been used in some high-profile hacks is effectively uh, a denial-of-service attack on people's push notifications and phones. So if the backend system is built kind of incorrectly, you can effectively ask for hundreds, thousands of dual authenticator requests all at once, every second. And so now your phone gets 900 bazillion push notifications saying, hey, are you trying to log in? And no matter how many times you hit no, you get another one right behind that. So to stop the attack, you hit yes and let in the attackers. Um, now, that issue has since been fixed. Um, but uh, the other belt and suspenders thing that I've seen is that the website will pop up a number. Uh, on, on their side, and your phone will have a selection of anywhere from like three to five different two-digit numbers. So now when you say, yes, it's me, I'm trying to log in, you hit yes, and it says, cool, which number is on your screen right now? And you have to pick the right one or else it sends a no back to the system. And that's to make sure that you are the person looking at the screen. Um, now, of course, there are other human ways to bypass it, especially if you're walking through somebody like scamming them over the phone. But that's you can break a lot of things by scamming people over the phone anyway. So I don't think that's really a major risk. The number thing is clever. That's that's a good solution. Um, but yeah, Duo, it's... It's fine. You know, is it better than SMS two-factor? Probably. Um, would I choose it over TOTP? I don't think so. So I do, well, so Google came out with something similar to what Duo does where they just, they pop up. Hey, we noticed this. Would you like to continue? And again, I don't want to throw out the bad with the good and saying, oh, you could do better. But for most people, that's pretty good. Uh, Apple does sort of the same thing, which I really like. It pops up everywhere and it gives you the location. Somebody's trying to locate and they put it on the map. Now, if you're using a VPN, it, it clearly doesn't work, but, but, and they give you the six digit code. I think it needs to be one or the other. I, for me, I feel like either hit yes 
don't hit yes and then click three different buttons. Either click yes or I got to type the six digit code. One or the other. I don't know. Uh, but either way, that's the probably the big one that I would recommend if you can start setting up find all the TOTPs. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that if you look at my Authy screen, it's there's probably 40 to 50 different services. And every time you log in, you have to go put this in and it becomes torturous. And, and unfortunately, the way to keep secure is you have to do this. And it bothers me. And I want something. I want this to be fixed. And I don't know if it's coming yet. I don't know. So... TOTP, that's the right way. Yubico OTP, I'm going to defer to Tom because I am not the expert on this. I'm more of U2F later, but what is you? What is Yubico OTP? Uh, so that was that was Yubico's initial foray into second factor. So that's the the thing where you hit the button, or now you hold the button, uh, and it spits out that long random random string of characters. Uh, it's a seated value on the actual security key. So a, a YubiKey, and I I did not come prepared. I did not have my YubiKey on me. Um, but basically, it's a tiny, thin, little USB stick that sits on your keychain. You plug it into the side of the machine. It's got usually a gold disc on it. You hit that, uh, and it spits out a long string of characters. Um, now, those contain uh, a public part and then a one-time key. Uh, and what that does, you, you set it up on a website and you usually put in five of these uh, Yubico keys or, or yeah, uh, in, in a row. And that lets them know, okay, it's this public ID and here's the sequence of, uh, of codes. We now know based on this what the next one is going to be. Uh, and it authenticates to YubiKey's ba or Yubico's backend or their own backend if they're running the, the Yubico software, the management software on their side. Um, and effectively what it is is a USB keyboard-based two-factor authentication because the, the YubiKey that you plug into your machine, the way it presents the hardware is it's just a USB keyboard. But when you hit that button, it generates a, a secure one-time password uh, and hits enter at the end and automatically submits it to websites. And it's really cool. It is super cool tech. Even if you have like a, a, a keyboard from a totally different region with a totally different layout, Yubico has picked the the character sets that do not change between keyboard locales so the yubikey that works in germany also works in india also works in the united states it is super super cool really neat tech the downside of course is that it's something you type in which means if you have something uh like you know a uh, 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 why am i blanking uh, if you have something like a keylogger on your system, uh, or if you're typing it into a phishing site, then yeah, you can get owned. And so security people have been kicking around this idea for a while. How do we make uh, a factor? How do we make an authentication factor that can't get phished? Uh, and it's it's a really hard problem. And and if you remember, YubiKey was on our show, and they did send us uh, years ago. Uh, YubiKeys that I, I still have somewhere. The problem is if you lose them. So they're expensive. So something like a YubiKey is $50. And they're awesome. Like I would highly recommend it because you don't have to push anything. You literally have to push the button. You push the button and it works. But you got to keep it on your keychain. You got to keep it in your wallet. You got to keep it everywhere. And, and like you said, it authenticates, but it, they're expensive. And then the iPhone has a lightning. So they went to NFC and there, and if you have an NFC device and you have a USB C device and you have a USB a device, now you have to find a way to get them all on. And that was the problem with them. So, so unfortunately, while they're awesome and they have like a management software, you can put your, your private key in for your, for your, for your encrypted email. Like they had all these cool features. They were just expensive and and even if they have a help me on the website, pick one, and they're going to default to the next one, U2F. So the next one after Yubico is U2F, uh, universal two-factor. A group of people, the Fido Alliance, came up with this idea that we're going to sell this hardware-based dongle, just like the YubiKey, except it's going to 
do something else. And that something else is not as difficult as the YubiKey, but it's going to uh, sort of accomplish the same thing. And these things are much cheaper. They're $25 that you can buy. And we'll get to Paskies in a second, but they're everywhere. And you can make your phone, like your iPhone can become a U2F device. Your Android phone can become a U2, uh, U2F device. And, and they opened it up in a way that makes things a lot easier to use. Yeah, it's all open standard stuff. There's a bunch of different companies making competing security key products. Um, and... The coolest part about this, uh, U2F for Universal Second Factor, or FIDO2, or Web Authentication, uh, abbreviated as Web Auth N, um, they all guard against phishing, which is really weird. So they do uh, effectively they sign a challenge. So a website will uh, send uh, just a piece of data and say, "Hey, send this or you know sign this piece of data." and then send it back to us because they know what the result of that will be because you you enroll a security key with the website. So it knows which key it is, what's the public key material, and what a signature on a piece of data should look like. Um, what you have to understand is that in that data payload that they send you is the domain name. And that can't be spoofed because the browser interacts with it. And so the, the browser actually has standards that interoperate with this, this key signing standard. Uh, so when you go to facebook.com, that facebook.com, that URL actually gets sent, that host gets sent as part of the signing challenge. So if you're at, you know, scammy site that's not facebook.com, you're signing a challenge request to log into a scammy site that's not facebook.com. So they're not gonna get the second factor that you signed and authenticated to facebook.com they're going to get a signed second factor for their own scam website which does them no good whatsoever uh so effectively these keys are phishing proof which is or or i shouldn't even say proof because nothing in security is guaranteed but right now we don't know of a great way for these things to be actually fished um unless you're somehow man in the middle of the line through HTTPS and catching things in transit and stopping it and then redirecting. Like, I, I'm sure it's possible, but it is extremely hard. You, the average person, the average computer user, you're not going to get hacked like this. So if you choose something like the, the cheaper $25 you key that does U2F, it does FIDO2, it does web authentication, uh, you're going to be belt and suspender security above the rest. The only downside to this is not every website supports this stuff yet. It's not as common as something like the rotating six-digit key, that's TOTP. Uh, there's a few websites that really work with it. Google for one, GitHub, uh, the pantheon of Microsoft sites, those all work with it. Um, I, I know Fastmail works with it. Most password managers work with it. Uh, the downside is that it's just not common enough, but it'll get there. It's an open get, standard and people keep adding it. It's going to get there. This is now a different, this is going to be a whole nother show, but Apple pass keys, or we say Apple pass keys, but it's part of the, the web authent alliance, the FIDO2 alliance and everything else. They're trying, Apple came up with this idea and I'm sure they're all going to adopt it because they actually did do something that was open, not just to them, where you take a picture with your phone and you have, you have, you make your phone that U2F, but just for that site. And we'll get into that and everything else. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the fallback safety. So here's the problem with all of this. Uh, it's the, what happens if you have none of them? Can you get into your account if you have none of them? And the short answer is, what's the weakest link? So we're talking about all these strong methods of encryption. If the weakest link is the customer service agent, you have zero factors of authentication. Um, it's if, if you say, well, at the end of the day, you text me at the end, if I have nothing, then text messaging is your weakest factor. And I'm not saying this is for everybody, but again, if you're being specifically targeted, somebody's gonna go through and really try to go after you. If they're just running your list or a credential stuffing attack and they're just putting in username and passwords, 
and they get that they're not going to sit there unless they need to to get into your account by trying all your fallbacks but the point is once you get this going and this is this was hard for me start looking at what's the weakest link and for the most part it's going to be sms and some websites won't allow you to get rid of it but if you can you want to get rid of the 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 weakest factor there so if you go all in on this get rid of sms be aware that that's the problem you can't so let's say you lose your yubikey well most websites will allow you to use your totp uh, authy google authenticator something else that's great now what happens if you lose your yubikey and your time-based token and then the fallback is SMS. If you get rid of that SMS, you have to now call the company and they have to do this thing and verify you and everything else. So that fallback safety becomes super important. Yeah, my my usual go-to for, for most services is going to be, uh, you know, my, my U2F YubiKey uh, and TOTP as a fallback. And honestly, most of the time, I don't have my YubiKey on me. Sometimes I do. But most of the time, I'm just firing up Authy. I'm looking on my phone, and I'm grabbing the code and pasting it in. Um, and that's fine. I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable security posture for average people to, to take up. Um, now, stuff that's super important, you know, do you go as far as getting rid of TOTP? I wouldn't. I like having that backup uh, just in case I lose a key. Because that would be awful. And yeah, you can go through the password reset and deactivating two-factor authentication. And a lot of sites will give you uh, backup codes um, that they say, okay, go ahead and print these out and put them in a safety deposit box. Let's be real. No one's going to do that. Copy the codes, put them in your password manager. Uh, now, again, the downside there is just like saving your TOTP keys inside of your password manager. Because if somebody cracks your password manager, they've got your backup codes and now they've got your account. Um, so nothing is going to be foolproof. And it's honestly kind of up to you about what kind of risk you're willing to stomach versus what kind of convenience or inconvenience you're willing to deal with. Again, if you're listening to this show for entertainment, you're not you're you're not having to worry about that. If you're the head of a company, you're the head of the DNC, okay, you're the president, you're a state leader, you have other problems and you have a team doing this for you. You are not losing your your Yubikis. Uh or somebody was gonna have copies of them, anything else. It, but this is for the average person. It's like I said, it's I'm at the point now where I feel comfortable getting rid of SMS. So as I'm going through these, I uncheck that box. I I have I, I think pass keys are the next step up. And again, we'll do a show on that. And then TOTP or some or my YubiKey there and moving from there. I don't have anything else. I think we're over time. I don't have the time, but I think we're over. So I would like to say let's let's start closing up shop. I have got one thing. Okay. So um the the Fido Alliance uh is also looking at pass keys as a single factor or the only factor. Uh, so instead of logging in with a username, a password, and then, you know, you plug your key in and hit that button and, and sign a challenge, uh, instead they're looking at just making that key your username and password and everything else. So imagine instead of logging into a website with something you know, it's just the thing you have. You just plug it in and you go. Now, the obvious danger there is if you lose it, yeah, people can just plug it into whatever machine they want, hit the button, and they're in. But it's something they're researching. Uh, it's not quite there yet, still very much in the experimental phase. But uh, we're all kind of watching with great interest because, man, that sounds convenient. And it also sounds somewhat safe. I still have some reservations there, but uh, I'm interested. And so far, the tech they've produced has been open and of pretty high quality. So. I, I am generally positive on the Fido Alliance. Great. Let's. We're waiting. Like you said, we will end up doing a full pass keys episode and seeing what we're doing there. So with that said, I got nothing else. So if that's okay, I think we're ready to say goodbye and move on. And we will. See... Oh, if you have a, if you want to, you have more questions, join our signal group. It's at the bottom of uh, each of the short explanation podcast pages there. You can email us, you can 
find us on Mastodon if you want. We're there. Uh, click the share buttons, all that stuff. We're there. You can ask us. We'll let you in. We have more and more. We have great conversation there. With that said, have a nice day, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you next week. See you, everyone. Bye.